the video. Hello, my name is Hassan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number 15, with my guest today, the returning Dave Baumrucker. Hello, David. Hi, how are you doing? So as you can see, Dave is, Dave is in his new studio. We're going to test this out a little bit. He's got a He's got a fancy mic the way I've got a fancy mic. And so if you're listening on the podcast, you should be coming in loud and clear. If you're watching this on the video, uh, you should be able to see his wonderful new studio. And uh, and we brought back Dave because today we are going to talk about this book. And if you just watched it on the video, you saw which book I held up. But if you're listening, I'm going to go ahead and read a a big chunk and we're going to be reading big chunks of this book today because this is a hard book to read and we're going to wrap our brains around it a little bit and it's the first four chapters of well it's the first four chapters of a monumental tome which i would encourage you to read uh written by an unhappy warrior on an exceptionally hot evening Early in July, a young man came out of the garret in which he lodged in S Place and walked slowly, as though in hesitation, towards K Bridge. He had successfully avoided meeting his landlady on the staircase. His garret was under the roof of a high, five-storied house and was more like a cupboard than a room. The landlady who provided him with a garret, dinners, and attendance lived on the floor below, and every time he went out, he was obliged to pass her kitchen, the door of which invariably stood open. And each time he passed, the young man had a sick, frightened feeling, which made him scowl and feel ashamed. He was hopelessly in debt to his landlady and was afraid of meeting her. This was not because he was cowardly and abject, quite the contrary, but for some time past, he had been in an overstrained, irritable condition, verging on hypochondria. He had become so completely absorbed in himself and isolated from his fellows that he dreaded meeting not only his landlady, but anyone at all. He was crushed by poverty, but the anxieties of his position had of late ceased to weigh upon him. He had given up attending to matters of practical importance. He had lost all desire to do so. Nothing that any landlady could do had any real terror for him. But to be stopped on the stairs, to be forced to listen to her trivial, irrelevant gossip, to pestering demands for payment, threats, and complaints, and to rack his brain for excuses, to prevaricate, to lie, no, no, rather than that. He would creep down the stairs like a cat and slip out unseen. This evening, however, coming out on the street, he became acutely aware of his fears. I want to attempt a thing like that, and I am frightened by these trifles, he thought with an odd smile. Hmm, yes, all is in a man's hands, and he lets it all slip from cowardice. That's an axiom. It would be interesting to know what it is men are most afraid of. Taking a new step, uttering a new word is what they fear most. But I'm talking too much. It's because of chatter that I do nothing. Or perhaps it is that I chatter because I do nothing. I've learned to chatter this last month, lying for days together in my den, thinking of, of Jack the Giant Killer. Why? Why am I going there now. Am I capable of that? Is that serious? It is not serious at all. It is simply a fantasy to amuse myself, a plaything. Yes, maybe. Maybe it is a plaything. There are authors in literature that lurk and walk around with slumped shoulders and shuffling feet, kind of like the zombies in the now ended, finally after all these years, Walking Dead franchise. And they lurk deep in the basement of the sub-basement of Western thought. Deep, deep in the sub-basement of Western thought. Behavior and our conceptions of reality. I'm using that in air quotes for whatever that may mean. Now, I've already mentioned the impact of Nietzsche. And we're going to talk about him. Don't worry, I keep promising and promising and promising. And he's a big boy, but we'll get to him. Um... And, you know, he had that wily German mustache and a penchant for making disciples and followers who would pick up all the wrong lessons from him and run with them. But there is another fellow who hangs out with a Nietzschean ideal down in the sub-basement of Western thought assumptions. And that's the guy we're going to talk about in his book that we're going to talk about today. Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky, born in Moscow in 1821, is the undeniable giant of Russian literature and the Western canon overall. His writing is relentlessly dour, 
angry, pessimistic, and invariably cynical about the state of human nature, probably due to him being influenced by Augustine, who we covered in City of God, a podcast episode earlier, which you may want to go back and listen to, Kant, who we have not covered yet, but we will, Hegel, and Balzac. And being a journalist and seeing the world as it was, as well as a military engineer due to his father's influence. So we'll talk about the influence of his father a little bit later. He influenced literally every Russian writer who followed him from Chekhov, who we covered on the podcast recently, to Solzhenitsyn, who we will be covering on a podcast in a future episode. We'll be talking about the Gulag Archipelago and One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Get ready for that. He first published our book today, Crime and Punishment, in 12 monthly installments during 1866. And this fictional story lays out the philosophical groundwork for later ideas of nihilism, existentialism, and rationalism that have served to rip the collective West to pieces following the nightmare of World War I, which I would argue, even though it's been 100 years, we're still experiencing the impacts of World War I. Now, I'm not quite sure what Dostoevsky would make of all of that if he were alive today. I think he'd kind of be shocked, actually. Now, our guest today is the returning Dave Baumrucker. Now, Dave introduced himself last time, and he talked a little bit about who he is and about what he does and about why he does what he does. And because of his insights, um, when we had him on episode number six, where we talked about the unbearable lightness of moral weakness <laughs> evident in Milan Kundera's work, we've invited him back to help us wrap our brains around the initial setup of the character of Raskolnikov and how Dostoevsky presents him in the first four chapters of Crime and Punishment. Now, for all of you who are going to kick back on me about this, let me be blunt. This book is hard. This book is long, and it requires a uh, emotional commitment from you that, well, you're going to have to make if you're really going to wrap your arms around this piece of Russian literature. By the way, we covered Vladimir Lenin's article in Pravda, How to Organize Competition. And if you look at Lenin historically, the other big boy of Russian literature and politics in the 20th century, Lenin had absolutely no truck with Dostoevsky whatsoever. And that should tell you something, right? Because Lenin was an intellectual totalitarian, as well as a representation of the totalitarian ideal for every tyrant that followed him in the 20th century. And tyrants need nihilism, existentialism, and secular moral rationalism to make some of the things that they want to work actually work. Hmm might be a really good idea to read Crime and Punishment. Or maybe you can start with The Idiot or Notes from the Underground or any of his other works, although I would not recommend going directly to the Brothers Karamazov. <laughs> if you think Crime and Punishment is tough, go tackle the three brothers over there. Welcome, Dave. Good to see you again, man. Any thoughts on Dostoevsky <laughs> for our folks as I... Take a sip of my coffee during this fine moment that we have here. Any thoughts initially on Dostoevsky? Um, I know that you had taken a look at Crime and Punishment. Now, the version that I've got is the Digi Reads edition from 2017. We'll be reading from that today. Um, but any edition of Crime and Punishment, is, particularly if it's translated from the original Russian, is going to be excellent. But any thoughts on this book to open us up? Yeah. Uh, I think that, uh, in general, I think Dostoevsky is really kind of almost like a mirror he's he's reflecting back what he sees what he experiences i think most importantly what he's feeling because i think the book and all the cat all the characters and how he sets up the characters are these embodiments they're like the they're meta real almost because each person takes on a character that exists in society or a role that exists in society and this book specifically i think if you can kind of pull, read between the lines and, and actually identify the themes that are in this book, you start to really realize like he is, I think both interested and curious, but also almost like sad and crushed by how he's viewing society. And then you get, 
again, we get introduced to the main character and the main character is this interesting embodiment of like, what is moral, what is just, and how do I rationalize what is moral and what is just. And it's those rationalizations that carry Raskolnikov through to not only um, his final act or his act of moral judgment, which I want to talk a little bit about that because there's a concept of justice and mercy that Dostoevsky introduces early. Um, <clears throat> but it also carries him through to his subsequent imprisonment in Siberia. Also very interesting, uh, considering that, you know, we're going, we're in a line this month from Lenin <laughs> and this arc of podcasts. We're in a line from, from Lenin organizing bugs <laughs> and, and, and capitalists, um, and I use the term organizing very loosely, all the way to, you know, um, what does one day in the life look like for someone who is part of that class that has been identified as being, um, well, immoral, right, or unjust because of success or because of ambition or because of economic prowess, right? And that's that historical determinism from Hegel, which, of course, comes through in Marx, which now we wind up with in, in Crime and Punishment a little bit. Uh, so there's a lot of different themes that he sets up initially. And again, I wonder what Dostoevsky would think about all of that. I wonder what he would have thought about the long, the long drawn out 20th century and how his ideas got played out. I, 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 I think it's a great question, because I think that I think in some ways, as if we look at our society as a whole, I think we've done some immense positive things but at the same time i think that there's still some speed bumps we cannot really we, we haven't been able to navigate some things in a, as a society as large and i think the the relationship with god and i think the regardless of what regardless of what the person any individual's relationship is or with the idea of god i think that that be, is still today just as prevalent and just as profound as it was you know in the 1860s in russia and I, it'd be very, very fascinating to, I guess, to get that lens, to understand, like to see what he sees, because I think when we go back and read this, I think it, there are most people that dive into this and want to articulate like the different dimensions of this book specifically are going to be, they're going to be presented with some very, very hard truths that we haven't really moved the needle much. We, we haven't, for everything that we've done, accomplished in the 20th century, um, it, we, we find ourselves coming back around again. And I, and I think that Dostoevsky is an Orthodox Christian. We talked a little bit about this before we started recording, but I think Dostoevsky as an Orthodox Christian would um, <clears throat> not be surprised by that because there's a certain idea that exists. Um, well, it comes from the Old Testament, but there's a through line, right, from the Old Testament all the way through Augustine and Thomas Aquinas um, even through the European philosophers of the Renaissance and then the early industrial period, there's this through line of thought, um, Christian thought in particular, that says that human beings are fallen and that's just it, you know, and that the tragedy is that human beings are fallen. Um, you know, we're, we're recording this on the other side of, um, of Easter and Passover. And so, you know, those are both celebrations of the, I should say celebrations, recognitions, because celebrations make it sound like it's a party. <laughs> those are recognitions of the necessity of picking up your cross and walking up the hill, which is something we cannot get around. We just can't, you know, you get to choose your cross. That's what freedom is. But also the idea that, and this comes from the Passover concept, or from the Passover concept, from the Passover um, ideal, um, you know, the Spirit of God passing over all the Egyptian or over the uh, Jewish houses uh, to kill the Egyptian babies as the last plague as a punishment on Pharaoh, which, by the way, is an interesting commentary on leaders. Leave that aside for just a second. But uh, <laughs> but um, this idea that God's judgment will fall on you if you don't, if you're not living up to the ideal, you know. And so those two dynamics we still struggle with psychologically. And it's interesting as we become more materially wealthy in the West, our struggles psychologically have become deeper. 
I think that's undeniable. And I, what I would say, just maybe tapping back into like what I do um, as my full-time gig, being a clinical therapist, uh, that's never been more evident with, with the COVID-19 experience. Mm -hmm. We find ourselves um, doubling down on materialism. We find ourselves doubling down on this, um, what seems to be a very simplistic, easy solution to this problem of, well, I'll just fill my time with X or I'll do this. Right. And unfortunately, um, the last few years have not been kind to many, many people because uh, if we are left with only materialism, I think that that puts a massive spotlight on our, our inequities and our, and our insecurities. And boy, um, I guess not to get too long winded with it. I, I think that in, in sense, when you were saying that we, the freedom is the, the, the ability for us to choose our cross. I, mm -hmm. I think that's a fundamental necessity that we all have to reflect on that, that there's, a, there's this undeniable presence of suffering in life. And that is not something to weep over, but rather almost like a call to action. Right. And we have to really just understand that um, everything is in balance. And if we choose to try to side skirt that or like to um, maybe think that we're above that, it only compounds and it becomes this monumental challenge that I think un unfortunately breaks a lot of people. Almost broke Raskolnikov mm -hmm. in Crime and Punishment. Getting back to the book, the Digi Reads edition from 2017, Crime and Punishment. He was so badly dressed that uh, even a man accustomed to shabbiness would have been ashamed to be seen in the street in such rags. In that quarter of the town, however, scarcely any shortcoming in dress would have created surprise. Only to the proximity of the Haymarket, the number of establishments of bad character, the preponderance of the trading and the working class population crowded in these streets and alleys in the heart of Petersburg. Types so various were to be seen in the streets that no figure, however queer, would have caused surprise. Now, in this context, just as I pause here for just a second, just to kind of set it up for folks, uh, Raskolnikov's walking around. He's thinking. Um, he's making his way uh, to uh, to his landlady's apartment. But there was such an accumulated bitterness and contempt in the young man's heart that, in spite of all the fastidiousness of youth, he minded his rags the least of all in the street. It was a different matter when he met with acquaintances or with former fellow students, whom, indeed, he disliked meeting at any time. And yet when a drunken man, who for some unknown reason was being taken somewhere in a huge wagon, dragged by a heavy dray horse, suddenly shouted at him as he drove past, Hey there, German hatter! Bawling at the top of his voice and pointing at him, the young man stopped suddenly and clutched tremulously at his hat. It was a tall round hat from Zimmerman's, but completely worn out, rusty with age, all torn and bespattered, brimless and bent on one side in an almost unseemly fashion. Not shame, however, but quite another feeling akin to terror had overtaken him. I knew it, he muttered in confusion. I thought so. That's the worst of all. Why a stupid nothing like this? The most trivial detail might spoil the whole plan. Yes, my hat is too noticeable. It looks absurd, and that makes it noticeable. With my rags, I ought to wear a cap, any sort of old pancake, not this grotesque thing. Nobody wears such a hat. It would be noticed a mile off. It would be remembered. What matters is that people would remember it, and it would give them a clue. For this business, one should be as little conspicuous as possible. Trifles, trifles are what matter. Why, it's just such trifles that always ruin everything. He had not far to go. He knew indeed how many steps it was from the gate of his lodging house. Exactly 730. He had counted them once when he had been lost in dreams. At the time, he had put no faith in those dreams and was only tantalizing himself by their hideous but daring recklessness. Now, a month later, he had begun to look at them differently, and in spite of the monologues in which he jeered at his own impotence and indecision, he had involuntarily come to regard this hideous, quote-unquote, dream as an exploit to be attempted, although he still did not realize this himself. He was positively going now for a, quote-unquote, rehearsal of his project, and at every step, his excitement grew more and more violent. I wanted to have Dave on because Dave deals with people's psychology. <laughs> and in some cases, perhaps, potentially, he can correct me if I'm wrong on this, psychopathy, 
um, or at least maybe the budding beginnings of it. And Raskolnikov is introduced here, and this is just in the first chapter, by the way, of Crime and Punishment. We haven't even gotten into the good stuff yet. We're like three pages in, and Dostoevsky is setting this up in a deep kind of way. Um, Raskolnikov is already a layered character just in these multiple paragraphs. You know, he's got poverty. He's a poor student. Um, he's hungry. He lusts for the good things of life, but he doesn't want to put in the work. Uh, Dave just talked about isolation. He is socially isolated and not because of a pandemic. He's socially isolated because he's isolated in his mind first, which then works out in concentric circles to everything else in his life. Now, there's a very Christian idea that floats underneath Dostoevsky's critique of this student, which is revealed in the paragraphs, is this Christian idea, which, again, we just, we're, we're going to talk about Christian ideas because we just can't get around it, right? I mean, that's, that's the context in which Dostoevsky wrote. He was a devout Orthodox Christian. He believed in it. Now, Christianity in a socialist sense, because he filtered his, his religion through his politics, but it was religion. And the idea he had in here that he's critiquing the student on the first part of crime and punishment is this idea that if you don't work, you don't eat. Now, the Bible espouses this and various leaders and regimes have espoused this since time out of mind, probably um, all the way from John Smith and the Jamestown colony to Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin. Yeah, that's right. Stalin thought that was a really good idea, too. If you don't work, you don't eat. Of course, he wound up in a different spot with it. Anyway, Raskolnikov, you know, rejects all of that, right? He's rejecting all of that in this first setup. And we're introduced to him as a shiftless person. And Dostoevsky brilliantly ties this shiftlessness to moral corruption. And that the and, and, and asserts, I think, that the cert with a he asserts that immoral behavior grows from a seed of mere shiftlessness into moral corruption without Raskolnikov really thinking too hard about it. Dave, is Dostoevsky onto something here? Or is he making a mountain out of a molehill? I mean, that's been a critique. Um, Nabokov, the Russian writer, didn't really like him. He was like, e whatever, like that you can't get there from here. Um... Chekhov didn't, it, well, I wouldn't say Chekhov did dislike Dostoevsky, but his critique of Dostoevsky would probably be, you're making a mountain out of a molehill, kind of that similar thing. Um, maybe not for everybody, but for some people, how does that, how does that seed grow in people, in your experience and what you've seen here? And does it match with what Dostoevsky is setting up with Raskolnikov in these very first few pages of Crime and Punishment? It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> whenever we become, whenever we start to feel dejected, especially from our in-group, and that would be society at the first level, uh, then our community within that society, and then our neighborhood, and then our family, you know, these different layers of things. Um, I think he's tapping into this idea, um, and we see it clinically, that when we, when we isolate, and also when we are feeling entitled. I think that there's this interesting thing that happens with us consciously that we start to rationalize why people need to give up other things or why we should be deserving of things. And it does create a very interesting spiral um, in our minds. And I don't think that he's making a mountain out of molehills. I think that he's really what he's doing is he's, he's identifying the fact that um, all of society in a weird way um, has been predicated on this idea of like a transcendent morality. And if we do not, I think that the, his, his critics, or I think even like the, like the Sam Harris's of the world, they try to make the argument that, um, that in a weird way, like they try to say that you could just take away this concept of transcendent morality and everything will just remain the same that this, um, in a weird sense, like I get the feeling that Dostoevsky is tapping into the idea that it's a fool's errand to think that m mankind by itself will reach this rational understanding with itself. 
and will will find itself in this like this moral playground of sorts where everyone is respected and everyone is treated equally and fair and i think the characters in this book especially the main character um is an embodiment of how that fails because he rejects he rejects god he rejects this idea of personal responsibility which is another massive theme in this book um and then we're then he's essentially presented with this interesting thing where he can now rationalize well when he's killing the pawnbroker i think that that's such mm -hmm. a fascinating compo component of this book um especially like just in how dostoevsky like does the setup like we we go he goes page after page after page like there's these chronicles of the build-up between mm -hmm. this war within his mind um raskolnikov's mind and i think that that's uh interestingly enough i think the people who are critiques of dostoevsky don't realize that like the critique kind of falls flat by how dostoevsky sets up raskolnikov to begin with like that <laughs> he this battle of rational arguments, yeah, I like it. Yeah, no, 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 no. You're you're right, and and it's it's God is dead, and we don't have enough blood, you know, water to wash. Okay, all right, cool, Nietzsche, great, yeah, cool. And what do we do afterward? Right. And and, and Dostoevsky presents the the realistic result of what happens after that. Now you would think that a hundred million dead people in the twentieth century would also set that up, but it seems like it seems like human beings need to it seems like human beings need to get a crack in the face again because <laughs> it seems as though we've forgotten that, right? Um, I, I'm not convinced, and this is where we part where I part from atheists, just period. I just part from them. I'm not convinced, and and, and, and as bright as Sam Harris is, and I've listened to his arguments, Dawkins, all those folks. God bless them. But where I part from them is I'm not, there is absolutely zero evidence in human history that I can see anyway from my reading of it that we can create our own ubermensch, our own transcendency out of our own will. Right. Because if that was a, if that was a, an objective truth, then where is it? Well, and if it was not only that, but I'll go to the Dostoevsky, let's get down to the ground. Let's actually see what is what does it actually look like, and not in some abstract government policy, not in some abstract institutional kind of way. No, 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 no. I want to see what you really do. There's this idea in um, the political, um, the political uh, person. Uh, what's his name? Uh, political theorist um, Saul Alinsky. There we go. There's this Alinskyan ideal idea that you make your enemies live up to their own rules. Mm -hmm. Well, Alinsky wasn't the first like creator of that. Augustine did that with the pagans back in City of God, right? <laughs> Which is one of the things we talked about in City of God. Um, and Lenin was Lenin as a totalitarian ideal was more than happy to live up to his own ideals. He was okay with that. Um but many, many atheists want to talk a good game about there not being a transcendent morality. And yet, I'm only really convinced that two atheists really died. David Hume would be one. And then, um, what's his name? Uh, Christopher Hitchens would be the second. I'm only really convinced that those two actually died taking that through to their logical to the to the absolute end, right? Yeah, I'm not convinced that the, that the other 99.9% .9 of them, even Sam Harris, I'm not convinced. I'm just not convinced because they the the behavior that they walk out, the way that they actually act, the gap between their words and their writing and their podcasts and their actions. I'm not convinced, and so. I, I don't think you can, I, I just, I don't think you can. I think Dostoevsky would agree with me. I don't think you can make your own idea. I don't think you just can't. I, you, you can't build a transcendent morality out of your own self. Well, because everything's predicated on something else. Right. But, I, I think my biggest, uh, what I'm confronted with all the time is that people will do this, will make this argument as well. People yeah. will make the argument that, um, that I can just go forth and do as I please and as I want and then they find themselves feeling in this weird, like they feel, they feel without, mm -hmm. and I think everything, 
And I think that that idea that you're saying that we can't just create our own thing. Uh, when, when do we, when do we, like modern society is built on the backs of giants that came before us, right? We always mm -hmm. mention this idea. And, and I think that every idea is just integrated into this, this, this contextual understanding of mankind. Mm -hmm. And so God has been around for a long time. This is the idea of God and the idea that society has predicated on itself in God's eyes or God's judgment. I, I think it's, I think it's very cavalier and I think it's very bold to make the argument that man can just do this, um, without, without some higher, without some higher authority, without some higher piece to it. I don't know if that's making sense, but it, I think yeah, I know. Pe people, there's a reason why there's a reason why parents have to watch their children. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's just maybe this is maybe the example I propose to people in, in therapy sometimes when I'm confronted with similar ideas is especially if they have children, why is it important that you don't leave your five-year-old alone in the house? And why is it important because that you don't leave a 10 year old or a 15 year old or tw even, even mm -hmm. a 16 year old alone next to your money or this it's because they need some authority. They need some teaching. They need guidance. They need something to essentially to, reflect off of and to understand themselves better and understand what they are and how, how they're going to get along in society. And I think that one of the evident, one of the pieces of evidence that I see is why we need to have this transcendent morality or why the denial of it leads to chaos is look what's happening in all of our major cities. Mm -hmm. When we, when we start to promote this idea that um, it's okay, just do as you please. Right. I don't want to get political with it, but I, I, I think that it's, it's a very observable thing we're all living through mm -hmm. that the past handful of years have really shown us that without something that binds us together, without something that unifies us and that we can, I guess that we can aspire to reach. It's like an ideal, right? This idea that we are, we are searching for this, um, this transcendent ideal, like we will become this thing. And in the eyes of this thing, that's viewing us regardless of how you define God, mm -hmm. um, Though that actually keeps us in bounds. It keeps mm -hmm. us in bounds not only with ourselves, but keeps us in bounds with our spirituality and it keeps us in bounds with our neighbors. Mm -hmm. Because without that, well I, I would make I would say this is that there's nothing irrational about a psychopath going after things he wants un with unscrupulously and getting what he wants. He's seeking self interest. Mm -hmm. And in that argument, right, we're essentially what I, I feel that they're making, if I'm understanding this correctly, that the Sam Harris is saying, well, that's okay. That's rational. Or these other people are saying that that's, that's, that's a rational way to go about things. And then they go, well, I guess maybe the, I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe they deny that that's rational. And then from my perspective it's going, but you're seeking, it, it seems like it's counter to itself. Well, and it's, it's not having the courage to live out your argument to its fullest end. Yeah. Let's let me hold your feet to the fire. Then, then it's completely rational for me to, <laughs> it's completely rational for me to take away your right to speak freely. Yes. Completely, totally rational. Yes. There's absolutely nothing rational in you being made to shut up or nothing irrational. I'm sorry. In you being made to shut up. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. And this is where we get into, well, we get into several different ideas. That's a rabbit hole right there, but you get into several different ideas there. But the biggest one I think is, um, has been exemplified in the Bible at the end of Judges where uh, <laughs> there was no, the last line in Judges is there was no king in Israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Uh, this is the Greek concept of, um, you know, man is the measure of all things, you know. And so uh, that final appeal to authority has to be to a higher thing than just the dude who's parallel to me with feet of clay or woman either way it doesn't matter the person who has feet of clay who's who's next to me um because the king is always fallible the the, the system is always corrupt um that's kind of the point um again if you have a dostoevskian worldview you know of course the system is corrupt like we're fallen human beings so what is outside of the system, objectively outside of the system that we can appeal to that will not be part of the system and that will be a, that will be a higher ideal. We were talking about before we started recording, 
about the intellectual ringing out of all of this that kind of led to, I love that phraseology that you used, uh, that kind of led to World War I. Um, and I want to revisit that idea in just a moment. But for the moment, back to the book. <clears throat> Again, from Crime and Punishment, Digi Reads Edition 2017. He rang the bell of the old woman's flat. And now we introduce the second astounding character. <laughs> Y'all are going to like her. The bell gave a faint tinkle as though it were made of tin and not of copper. The little flats in such houses always have bells that ring like that. He had forgotten the note of that bell, and now its peculiar tinkle seemed to remind him of something and to bring it clearly before him. He started. His nerves were terribly overstrained by now. By the way, if a guy like this came to you for therapy... <laughs> Um, he probably diagnosed probably what with like severe anxiety, probably depression. I'm not asking you to make a therapeutic judgment I mean, on him. Just saying, just initial anxious, thoughts. And he's definitely just he's definitely depressed. I think that uh, a lot of these characters have, um, depending on depending on how much we read into their behavior, there's a lot more going on with a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, in a little while, the door was opened a tiny crack. The old woman eyed her visitor with evident distrust through the crack, and nothing could be seen but her little eyes glittering in the darkness. But seeing a number of people on the landing, she grew bolder and opened the door wide. The young man stepped into the dark entry, which was partitioned off, uh, partitioned off from the tiny kitchen. The old woman stood facing him in silence and looked inquiringly at him. She was a diminutive, withered-up old woman of sixty with sharp, malignant eyes and a sharp little nose. Her colorless, somewhat grizzled hair was thickly smeared with oil, and she wore no kerchief over it. Round her thin, long neck, which looked like a hen's leg, was knotted some sort of flannel rag, and in spite of the heat, there hung flapping on her shoulders a mangy fur cape, yellow with age. By the way, great descriptors in here. I'm a guy who loves a turn of phrase. Great descriptors. Dostoevsky nails it here. The old woman coughed and groaned at every instant. The young man must have looked at her with a... Rather peculiar expression, for a gleam of mistrust came into her eyes again. <sighs> Love this. And now we're going to get into some long bits of dialogue, so follow me here, folks. Raskatnikov, a student, I came here a month ago. The young man made haste to mutter with a half bow, remembering he ought to be more polite. Talk about that whole social norming thing. I remember, good, my good sir, I remember quite well you're coming here, the old woman said distinctly, distinctly, still keeping her inquiring eyes on his face. And here, here I am again on the same errand, Raskalikov continued a little disconcerted and surprised at the old woman's mistrust. Perhaps she is always like that, though, only I did not notice it at the other time, he thought with an uneasy feeling. By the way, I like the dynamic that Dostoevsky does where he's going internal and external, internal and external, trying to show you both sides of the equation here. And then, of course, he adds in a third side from the old woman. The old woman paused as though hesitating, then stepped on one side and pointed to the door of the room, she said, letting her visitor pass in front of her. Step in, my good sir. By the way, I automatically think of Hansel and Gretel here. <laughs> Just come right into my little gingerbread house. <laughs> The little room into which the young man walked with yellow paper on the walls, geraniums, and muslin curtains on the windows was brightly lit up at that moment by the setting sun. So the sun will shine like this too then, flashed as it were by chance through Raskolnikov's mind with a rapid glance. He scanned everything in the room, trying as far as possible to notice and remember its arrangement. But there was nothing special in the room. The furniture, all very old and of yellow wood, consisted of a sofa with a huge bent wooden back, an oval table in front of the sofa, a dressing table with a looking glass fixed on it between the windows, chairs along the walls, and two or three halfpenny prints in yellow frames, representing German damsels with birds in their hands. That was all. By the way, uh, just as a side note, I want to pause here. There's going to be a lot of references. There are a lot of references in Crime and Punishment to German this and German that. And that is because historically, when uh, Dostoevsky uh, was writing this book, probably between, the, the estimates are between 1846 and 1866, he, he wrote off and on it for 20 years or so, um, but probably really sort of sort of started nailing it out um, in, the, in the early 1860s. Uh, Germany was just coming together um, as a nation state in Europe and was considered to be the cultural and moral center of Europe at the time and would be, by the way, until it crash landed in 1945. So everybody in Europe watched Germany 
and Germany watched everybody else. Back to the book. Um, in a corner, a light was burning before a small icon. Everything was very clean. The floor and the furniture were brightly polished. Everything shone. Lizaveta's work, thought the young man. There was not a speck of dust to be seen in the whole flat. It's in the house of spiteful old widows that one finds such cleanliness, Raskolnikov thought again, and he stole a curious glance at the cotton curtain over the door, leading to another tiny room, in which stood the old woman's bed and a chest of drawers, into which he had never looked before. These two rooms made up the whole flat. I'm going to pause here for just a second. It's in the house of spiteful old widows that one finds such cleanliness. Uh, is that objectively true? I wonder. I wanted to ask you that. Is that objectively true? Or is that just, you know, a uh, passing think, observation? <laughs> I don't think it's objectively true. But I, I do think that... Um, the more people, the more people become spiteful. The more people... Um, take a kind of a holier than thou stance and i think that people keep their houses clean in that reference because they feel that um well that's what that's what good and qualified people do right right well and we don't talk a lot about spite in our culture much anymore i mean pff, my gosh um we almost like well just like all of the old all the old sins we just we don't we don't name them uh and if we don't name them then they don't exist um but it is interesting that that there's this idea that Dostoevsky is revealing uh, that, you know, the, the, the phraseology used to be back in the day that uh, cleanliness is next to godliness, which, again, we don't say that anymore um, because we don't really believe it. But um, But there is this idea that somehow if you're cleaner, then you're more ordered. And thus more holy. And so he's kind of playing with that here um, a little bit, you know, from the description of the woman all the way to the description of the room. Back to the book. What do you want? The old woman said severely coming into the room and as before standing in front of him so as to look him straight in the face. I brought something to pawn here and he drew out of his pocket an old fashioned flat silver watch on the back of which was engraved a globe. The chain was of steel. But the time is up for your last pledge. The month was up a day before yesterday. I will bring you the interest for another month. Just wait a little. But that's for me to do as I please, my good sir, to wait or sell your pledge at once. How much will you give me for the watch, Aliano Ivanova? You come with such trifles, my good sir. It's scarcely worth anything. I gave you two rubles last time for your ring, and one could buy it quite new at a jeweler's for a ruble and a half. Give me four rubles for it. I shall redeem it. It was my father's. I shall be getting some money soon. A ruble and a half. An interested advance, if you like. A ruble and a half, cried the young man. Please yourself. And the old woman handed him back the watch. The young man took it and was so angry that he was on the point of going away, but checked himself at once, remembering that there was nowhere else he could go and that he had had another object also in coming. Hand it over, he said roughly. The old woman fumbled in her pocket for her keys and disappeared beneath, behind the curtain into the other room. A young man left standing alone in the middle of the room listened inquisitively thinking. He could hear the unlocking, the chest of drawers. By the way, I love that. Again, I love the soundscape that Dostoevsky is playing with here. Um, it's, it's all of Raskolnikov's heightened senses as he becomes tenser and tenser, moving towards the moment of decision, not decision, but because he's already made the decision, that's what Dostoevsky is showing, but moving towards the moment of action. Um, and even in, in warfare, you see this, right? Things become clearer um, as all of the extraneous things become stripped away. Veterans will often talk about this, you know, the, the clarity of, of hearing bullets, right? Or the clarity of... Um, the clarity of seeing the field of battle um, long after the decision is made and now we are moving towards action and all of the extraneous garbage just fades back mm -hmm. into the background. And this is what Dostoevsky is showing here with Raskolnikov's actions and his perceptions. And again, we're still in the first chapter of Crime and Punishment. It must be in the top drawer, he reflected, so she carries the keys in a pocket on the right. 
all in one bunch on a steel ring. And there's one key there three times as big as all the others with deep notches. That can't be the key of the chest of drawers. And there must be some other chest or strong box. That's worth knowing. Strong boxes always have keys like that. But how degrading it all is. The old woman came back. Here, sir. As we say, 10 kopecks the ruble a month, so I must take 15 kopecks from a ruble and a half the month in advance, but for the two rubles I lent you before, you owe me now 20 kopecks on the same reckoning in advance. That makes 35 kopecks altogether, so I must give you a ruble and 15 kopecks for the watch. Here it is. Now, <laughs> just like she's got OCD with the house, <laughs> she abs... And again, that's not a clinical diagnosis. I want to be... I am not a clinician. I'm just going off of what I'm reading here. Um... Just like she's very particular, maybe I should change the clinical diagnosis, the clinical terms. Just like she's very particular with the house, she's also very exact with the money. Um, again, revealing something about herself, layering something into her psychology that, that uh, Dostoevsky wants us to pay attention to here. Otherwise, he wouldn't be telling us this. Back to the book for just a moment. What? Only a ruble and 15 kopecks now? That's Raskolnikov. Just so. The young man did not dispute and took the money. He looked at the old woman and was in no hurry to get away, as though there was still something he wanted to say or do, but he did not himself know quite what. I may be bringing you something else in a day or two. Aliana Ivanova, a valuable thing, silver, a cigarette box, as soon as I get it back from a friend. He broke off in confusion. Well, we will talk about it then, sir. Goodbye. Are you always home alone? Your sister is not here with you? He asked her as casually as possible as he went out on the passage. What business is she of yours, my good sir? Oh, nothing in particular. I simply asked. You were too quick. Good day, Alyona Ivanovna. Raskolnikov went out in complete confusion. I love that last bit for <laughs> all that dialogue, all of the intensity that happens in that scene, the setup. He has no clue what just happened. Let's talk about this idea of deserves. <laughs> Dostoevsky sets up Ivanovna as a terrible person. But he doesn't give, at least not initially, not in the first four chapters. Now, subsequent in the book, he does give her a little bit. He fleshes her out a little bit as a character. But in the first four chapters of the setup, he merely sets her up as a foil, as a as a villain, right? Um, and But he does it quite cleverly because he's setting her up both as a victim and a villain at the exact same time. And while Raskolnikov may be morally weak and ill-tempered, uh, which I think we would probably agree about that, um... Evanovna is set up as being truly cruel and deserving justice. I think of the is scene in the movie Unforgiven. I, I love I love Clint Eastwood westerns and I love that one the most of all because it was it was his final statement on the western and uh, you know the scene at the end where Gene Hackman is laying on the floor after Clint Eastwood has basically cleaned out the bar and Clint walks over to him with a double-barreled shotgun and he puts a double-barreled shotgun uh, on, uh, on uh, Gene Hackman's mouth and Gene Hackman goes, I don't deserve this. I was building a house. And Gene Hackman is corrupt. He's cruel. He's probably what the town needs to keep it in line but he is he's he, he is by a modern moral standard evil and Clint Eastwood gives the great line which ties into this deserves got nothing to do with it and he blows the back of his head out and then he walks out of town by the way yelling at everybody that like if you if you come to me I'm gonna kill all of you too and that they bury better bury Morgan Freeman if they don't he's gonna come back <laughs> And take care of them deserves got nothing to do with it i think dostoevsky would agree did Ivanova deserve to get killed 
And I'm not, spoiler alert, she gets killed. Like, come on, the book's been around a while. You can go pick, it's been 140 years, you can go pick it up. <laughs> There's plenty of things to read about on the internet. Dave and I were talking about this analysis, looking at this commentary. I'm adding to a larger pile that's already gigantic around this book. A lot of crust has been built up around this book. Um, we're exploring it for leaders, but there's plenty of information. So anyway, she gets killed. Did she deserve to get killed? Subjective. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's my first response. I mean, I think maybe to maybe answer that question, I, I will, I'll give you this. Who creates who? Right? Does the pawnbroker create Raskolnikov? Or does the society that um, the pawnbroker exists in force her to be that person because there is no there's no morality there is no higher order there is no anything so she has to be unscrupulous uh, essentially because she knows that everyone's a liar and she knows that everyone is not worth what they say they're worth right so does she deserve to die depends whose eyes are casting that you know. Dr. Manhattan had a great line in chapter four of The Watchmen, a book, graphic novel we covered um, on a previous podcast. Great book, great freaking graphic novel. And Alan Moore basically puts the line in um, in Dr. Manhattan's mouth, the omnipotent, the omnipotent God man who can put himself back together. Uh, he goes to Mars and he ruminates on how he became who he is, basically. And he asks a great question, who makes the world? Or is it always been made? Is it a watch without a watchmaker? Uh, doubling down. And Alan Moore, of course, wrote this in the 1980s. So doubling down on this concept of, you know, rationality and existential crises. And I think Dostoevsky does a good job here in setting up um, the pawnbroker Ivanovna. And then, of course, there's her sister, which we're not going to get into that. That's the opposite side of the coin. Again, that's where she rounds out a little bit more. But setting her up as both villain and victim. Raskolnikov is confused. Why is he confused at the end of that interaction? <laughs> I mean... I'd probably be confused too, but but I'm not driven by the same things that he's driven by. I'm, I'm it's best speculation, I guess, from my end would be is he walks in there and he's desperate. He's desperate for something to change in his life, and he's mm -hmm. he's also hungry. And he's um, when people like the whole statement, "Hungry people don't stay hungry for long." I think that when we get when Raskolnikov when he walks in there, he knows that this is where I said opportunity lies or lives. And he's now confronted with this woman that has no physical defense yet has this mental defense on him. And I think that the pawnbroker has a certain level of narcissism to her. And I think that she has a certain level of, um, in a weird way, even this, like, this kind of antisocial dimension to her that she views people like she views everything transactionally and that she, she removes the human component from it. You want X, I give you Y with the interest of Z. And she's unwilling to see the humanity in the situation. And she's unwilling to bend that situation for his favor. Um, I think that he's confused because she's not afraid of him. She doesn't even consider him a threat. And I think that even as much as he's prying in that situation and he's almost like trying to almost like call her out, like asking her to challenge him, she simply really doesn't. She just dismisses him. And I, I think that that's a very interesting, for someone who maybe has that predatory lens in the situation that's going in there going, look, I'm looking for opportunity. I'm looking for this opening. I need to... I'm doing recon on sorts because mm -hmm. I, I know that there is an opportunity here. And for this little old woman to maybe as sharp as she might be in her dialect and in her, in her presentation, she doesn't even consider him. Is the predator in her willfully blind? Are you asking, is the pawnbrokers 
Yeah, is the thing inside of her willful? Has her narcissism made her willfully blind? As you were talking, I was thinking, there's this, there's this idea, um, floats around everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joseph Campbell explored it in *The Power of Myth*. More recently, you know, Jordan Peterson, Maps of Meaning. There's a long line of people, you know, Carl Jung, all this. Okay. There's this idea that um, whatever it is that is in your psychological house, right, can basically block you from seeing a threat coming if you're not paying attention and sharp and on it, right? And and what you just said there about the pawnbroker she dismisses him. She doesn't even look at him as a threat. But she's a snake in a garden of other snakes. And so is she just willfully blind? Is she just missing the mark because of her own narcissism? It's a great question. I, I think for me to really answer that question, truthfully, I, I w- it comes down to, we have to ask another question is, what is the motivation behind beating like her? Was it her half sister? Like, so I think when we ask the question, if we can, if you explore the idea of what is the motivation, what is the personal motivation? What is maybe the structural necessity for her to beat her half sister? Because if that's just backlash, if that's just her venting, then potentially, but if she's doing it because she needs to keep that person in line, then I shift away from her being willfully blind and rather being um, shifting back into this idea of this antisocial thing. There's a justification like people are not people. People are cogs in a machine that I can turn to get to the get the outcomes that I want. Because mm-hmm. oftentimes, I mean, the biggest mm-hmm. the biggest thing that I find with the, with this character is that it seems, it seems to me that she's very aware of what's going on in society and very aware of the role that she plays and very mm-hmm. aware of the leverage that she has. And more importantly, I think that she views herself as being above society. And I don't mm-hmm. know if I would qualify her as being willfully blind because if I apply that lens to her, I think that she, I think that she justifies her actions as a necessity to maintain the status quo. And I think that that's a little bit different. Got it. Something else clicked over and something else just clicked over in my head there. So it's the difference between, um, there's a difference between, and we've been exploring this again on the podcast this month. There's a difference for leaders between a totalitarian and a tyrant. You can have a to- a totalizing idea in your head as a leader and not be tyrannical about it. You could be benevolent. Will you be dictatorial? That's a different layer down. Potentially, you probably will be. Um, But you can have a totalizing idea and not be tyrannical. More likely than not, you will be tyrannical, but you you can't separate those two. But you cannot be a tyrant without a total a totalizing <laughs> ideal as a matter of fact most tyrants have totalizing ideas um and they're dictatorial and everything just kind of floods out from that right the example of this that's proved out in history is lenin lenin was an absolute totalitarian first and he was a tyrant in terms of administration of his totalizing idea second. He would have been a totalitarian without the Russian state. If he'd been in charge in Finland, he would have been a totalitarian. He'd been in charge in America, he would have been a totalitarian. The the system that was underneath him uh, did not concern him, right? It didn't, he didn't care about it. On the other hand, you got a guy like Stalin, and this is where Lenin was afraid of Stalin. Lenin actually wrote at the end of his life in a letter to the Politburo, uh, said, you know, you can't, you can't let this guy, you can't let this guy be in charge. <laughs> like he's, <laughs> he's dangerous. He's a nut. <laughs> Which the irony of that, of course, abounds. Um, but, um, but Stalin was a tyrant. Stalin wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't a totalitarian. He was just tyrannical. Well, when you look at, Uh, the pawnbroker, and you look at the relationship between the pawnbroker and her sister, 
she may be a totalitarian when she's looking at all of the other people that she's dealing with, but she's a tyrant with her sister. She's tyrannical in, in that, <clears throat> in that regime. And the thing about a totalitarian is they always miss the idea that there might be something outside of that totalizing scheme. And that's potentially where the blindness comes from because the, the Egyptians have this idea of Horus, right? The, the one eyed you know, the one eyed God, right? And Horus loses his eye because he's blind and his son has to go down into the underworld. I think if I remember the myth correctly, the son has to go down into the underworld and, and you know, pull up the, uh, you know, go battle basically death and get his father's eye back and restore, restore the eye. Right. Um, you see this also in Greek mythology, right? Where, um, I can't remember who it is, but, uh, uh, you know, basically, you know, he gets his liver eaten and restored, you know, all the time on the rock. So there's this concept uh, from myth that then falls into falls into history and psychology that basically, you know, you can be totalizing if you want, but there's always something outside of that totalizing ideal that's going to trip you up because you can't see everything. You only have one eye. Um, but at a personal level, and I think Dostoevsky really gets down to this, and by the way, so did Chekhov, when you get right down to it in the real, in the, the one-on-one, the small things, right, it always devolves to tyrannical behavior. Well, and I think that the pawnbroker has to be a tyrant with her sister because, I mean, if we, if we make the maybe assumption that she's not only a totalitarian and the ideal that she like of the position that she holds and the role Mm -hmm. that she has her sister not bending the knee to her Mm -hmm. the sister not doing that is a challenge to her authority Mm -hmm. and i don't know many totalitarians that do well with challenges to their authority because right that that shreds up the idea of their own totality yeah yeah i was watching some north korean propaganda the other day very well produced by the way um and yes i'm North Korea is a country I'm fascinated by. I have been for many, many years um, for a whole variety of reasons. But it was really interesting watching the the totalizing nature of that propaganda. And it's clearly propaganda. They're not they're not hiding it. They're like, yes, this is I mean, this is what we're doing, you know, but they've reached a point as a as a culture (laughs) where there's there's that element of embarrassment or holding back or sort of kind of quantifying it that that's gone that's gone they're just they're full on they're full on into it and so um you also see that in um Ivanovna um you see that in Raskolnikov although he's working towards it gradually and I think that's part of the other reason why he's confused at the end of that interaction um is it's two totalizing ideas meeting each other and trying to feel each other out. And I think also he's confused because I think he went into that not thinking that the pawnbroker was aware of how society views her. And I think that he leaves going, oh, wow, she's very aware of how society views her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, kids, we're still in the first chapter. (laughs) This is what I'm saying. Go go read this book, you know, go take a look at it, go take your time with it. It's going to take you a year to read it. It's fine. Take your time. Um, Leaders should read hard things. Um, I've made this point on a shorts episode recently. Leaders should read hard books, Um, read hard literature. And and this is one of the hardest pieces of literature you're you're going to read, I would assert, as a leader. Back to the book. So we're going to skip over a bunch of things. Um. Raskolnikov's wandering through the streets of St. Petersburg. Um, he's left the pawnbroker's shop. He goes to a tavern. The description of the interior of the tavern is amazing. I'm going to skip over all of that. It's a huge chunk of information. And he runs into a, a clerk, basically, an out-of-work, um, besotted, uh, these days we would say alcoholic clerk. And the clerk... Well, the clerk um, allows Dostoevsky, the clerk character, allows Dostoevsky to explore some dynamics in uh, Russian society and Russian culture between men and women. 
um, between government officials and students. Um, and it allows him to bring in this idea, uh, again, filtering into Russian society at the time he was writing this from Marx around class consciousness. And, and again, Marx was not the first, Marx and Hegel, or Hegel, Marx and Engels were not the first people to kind of come up with this idea, but they were the first ones to bring everything together and codify it into one <laughs> totalizing idea um, around uh, the, the orbit or in the orbit. Nah, I'll frame it this way. One totalizing idea around the sun of a communal, or dare I say communist, state. Back to crime and punishment. So he's in the tavern, and then he's sitting down, and he's getting ready to have a drink. He looked repeatedly at the clerk, partly, no doubt, because the latter was staring persistently at him, obviously anxious to enter into conversation. At the other persons in the room, including the tavern keeper, the clerk looked as though he were used to their company and weary of it, showing a shade of condescending contempt for them as persons of station and culture inferior to his own, uh, with whom it would be useless for him to converse. He was a man over fifty, bald and grizzled of medium height and stoutly built. His face, bloated from continual drinking, was of a yellow, even greenish tinge, with swollen eyelids of which keen reddish eyes gleamed like little chinks. But there was something very strange in him. There was a light in his eyes as though of intense feeling. Perhaps there were even thought and intelligence, but at the same time, there was a gleam of something like madness. He was wearing an old and hopelessly ragged black dress coat with all its buttons missing, except one. And that one he had buttoned, evidently clinging to this last trace of respectability. A crumpled shirt front covered with spots and stains protruded from his canvas waistcoat. Like a clerk, he wore no beard nor mustache, but had been so long unshaven that his chin looked like a stiff grayish brush. And there was something respectable and like an official about his manner too. But he was restless. He ruffled up his hair from time to time, let his head drop into his hands, dejectedly resting his ragged elbows on the stained and sticky table. At last he looked straight at Raskolnikov and said loudly and resolutely, May I venture, honored sir, to engage you in polite conversation? For as much as though your exterior would not command respect, my experience admonishes me that you are a man of education and not accustomed to drinking. I've always respected education when in conjunction with the genuine sentiments, and I am besides a titular counselor in rank. Marmeladov, such is my name, titular counselor, I make bold to inquire, have you been in the service? No, I am studying, answered the young man, somewhat surprised at the grandiloquent style of the speaker and also at being so directly addressed. In spite of the momentary desire he had just been feeling for company of any sort, on being actually spoken to, he felt immediately his habitual, irritable, and uneasy aversion for any stranger who approached or attempted to approach him. A student then, or formerly a student, cried the clerk, just what I thought. I'm a man of experience, immense experience, sir. And he tapped his forehead with fingers in self-approval. You've been a student, or have attended some learned institution, but allow me. He got up, staggered, took his jug and glass, and sat down beside the young man facing him a little sideways. He was drunk, but spoke fluently and boldly, only occasionally losing the thread of his sentences and drawling his words. He pounced upon Raskolnikov as greedily as though he had not spoken to a soul for a month. A warning to readers in America, and this is probably going to do well in Russia, although I hear they're having trouble with the internet these days, but... um. A <laughs> warning to my American readers. Um, we struggle with class in America. Um, we've done a really awesome job of trying to flatten all of that. And we've substituted class consciousness for race consciousness in America. And so, of course, if Dostoevsky were writing this in an American context, the clerk or maybe Raskolnikov would be of one race or another. Pick your particular degree of melanin here and he wasn't but 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 because he was writing it in russia because it was coming out of a western european and eastern european context he wasn't confused by class as a matter of fact that was the thing that was driving raskolnikov um as a matter of fact in works like the brothers karamazov he would hold up the marxist myth of a class struggle to severe critique um and of course in the idiot he would do that as well a little bit earlier 
And I don't think Dostoevsky was confused or impressed with class. As a matter of fact, he um, he went to Siberia. He had his own class struggles. Um, he uh, he was a rabble rouser from the beginning. Um, when he went into when he was forced by his father uh, his, his, to to go into a military service, um, he was a fighter um, around class. As a matter of fact, he was a rock ribbed socialist. I'll be very clear on that. Not a communist, a socialist. Um, and he believed fundamentally that socialism, again, could be filtered through Christianity. And then at the end of his life, he filtered his Orthodox Christianity through his socialism. When we look at class and race, and we are in America, and this is, this is we are 20, 22 years into the 21st century, What do we do with race in America? Yeah, we're finally going to go. We're finally going to hit on that because, <laughs> you know, I'm a guy with melanin in my skin. You're a guy with a little less melanin in your skin. <laughs> but we've been kind of dancing around this a little bit um, for the last couple of podcasts. And eventually, by the way, we will read on the podcast W.E.B. Dewa's Soul of Black Folk. We're also going to be reading Booker T. Washington's Up from Slavery. Um, because you got to get both sides of that argument. And W.E.B. Du Bois turned out to be a committed communist who went and lived in France um, after abandoning America. Um, and many, by the way, black writers um, who were, you know, fundamentally American wound up abandoning America, not because of the lack of belief in America, but because of the lack of belief in America living up to the ideal that is stated in the founding documents and being disappointed with that. But this is Russia, and this is class, and we live in America, and we have race. How do we reconcile those two together in our heads as American readers of this very complicated material, David? Profound question. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, so we have made the attempt, I guess, I guess on paper, we have made the attempt to push forward this idea of meritocracy uh, as like the equalizer of all things. I don't know if that's necessarily working. Um, meaning that I, I think that we all need to promote ourselves based off of the merit we bring to society. And, but that therein lies an interesting, but there's a, there's like, there's an interesting shadow here that, that is when we talk about race, every race is a different experience in America. And I think that, I don't know. That's a, I mean, it's a very interesting question. Like what do we do about race in America? I think that it has to be whatever we choose to do needs to be um, an agreement that we all carry. I think that maybe that the, the best way I want to answer this question is that mm -hmm. somehow, some way we have to find common ground. We either have to agree to disagree and move forward with that position, or we have to come together and somehow, some way unify over the things that connect us, not the things that are different from us. Well, and it's interesting, Crime and Punishment was published in 12 monthly installments in 1866 in Russia. And the... The one war that Europe overlooked and European generals claimed they could learn nothing from was the American Civil War particularly European generals in World War I. And yet, the American Civil War is the first example of 20th century warfare and murder at scale, I would assert. Um, I take out the summer nonsense of 1840 in, in uh, France, I dismiss the first Russo and the second Russo Japanese war. I even dismiss the Spanish American war because those, those were one could argue and many have that those were media creations that were more propaganda than anything else. Okay. But world war one is where it kicked off. I mean, the Somme. I mean, you had 50,000 people die at the Somme. Like it's, it, it was just, a, it was just a carnal house. Well, how many people died at Gettysburg? How many people died at Shiloh? How many people died at Vicksburg? Um, 
that's a war that Europeans didn't pay attention to. And I keep saying this to black and white people in America. We already solved the race problem. 725,000 white people died to solve the race problem. Solved. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. would probably disagree with me. Okay. And I didn't live through the post-Civil War era with Jim Crow. I was born long after all of that was already all taken care of and done. And maybe I am speaking from a position not of privilege, but just of my historical perspective. So I'll grant you that. I'll, I'll, I'll grant, you that, grant you that premise uh, that pushes back on that. And are people racially <laughs> driven? For sure. Of course, people are racially driven. Asians are racially driven. Uh, Hispanics are racially driven. Uh, Africans are racially driven. But the only people on the planet that don't get to be racially driven are white people. Now, I'm not drawing you into something here. I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there's an irony there, and I'm just going to put a check mark on that irony and leave folks to think about that for just a minute. And I'm going to ask the much deeper question here, which is. You can intellectualize all of this all day, but eventually, if you do the intellectual ringing out, like we were talking about a little bit earlier, you're going to wind up at a reckoning. And usually the reckoning is warfare, and usually it's killing on a massive scale. This happened in Europe with World War I on the back end of Dostoevsky's life. Is there any way to avoid that kind of reckoning? I, I think so. But I think it it, re it requires people to really keep their egos in check, because I think that war is a condition or maybe a consequence of viewing yourself as different. And I think that that is a that becomes a very, very interesting like theme throughout at least my examination of history. Every culture, every culture that views themselves as being a different entity, a different ideal, a different philosophy, a different edict, essentially, or ethic that, that they uphold and they're confronting with a different culture, oppose it when, when we find ways to essentially just explore that and be curious and be interested and be inviting to this idea that there's more than one, one path. I think that that's the pathway forward for us. And I think that we've seen that in several cultures. I think that we've seen that in several countries do that really, really well. Uh, and going back to what you said about, you know, the civil war in America, when we, you know, we solve the problem of race, I think we solve the problem of race on paper. I, I think that's what I would say is what the civil war is a bloody because, piece of paper. Well, what I mean by that is that the civil war allowed us to essentially meet each other on common ground. That if we are going to if we're going to be free, then let's be free. Mm -hmm. if we're not going to be free. Let's not be free, right? Mm -hmm. Or if there's going to be if there's going to be leveraging in society, then let's just call it for what it is. And I think the Civil War made a point on a more like philosophical level that we need to like we need to meet each other on level level ground. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was a great start. And I think that the Civil Rights Movement became an, an addition to that start. I think it became like chapter two. Mm -hmm. And if we fast forward to, you know, the summer, uh, I guess the spring and summer of 2020 with the George Floyd incident, I, I think that that was our first, that was our first maybe boiling over point in a long time. I mean, there have been so many uh, tragedies, I, I guess that's the only way to say it. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, and it's so interwoven with every day in society. People get murdered, people die, there's atrocities in downtown America everywhere. I think, I think when we talk about, can we, how do we solve the problem of race in America? I think it goes, this goes threads back into the, maybe the underpinning of some of these things in this book, mm -hmm. that there needs to be a personal responsibility and an accountability on everyone's level. And I think that if we are going to dismiss behavior based off of the perceived racial prejudice that someone might be applying to somebody. I think that that is a very, very dark spiral. Meaning that I think that if we can rationalize someone's behavior because, oh, well, but that's what we had to do, or that's what they had to do, or that's just us being us, right? 
trying to use maybe ambiguous language just so it applies to everyone here. Um, you said when you were talking about people being racially driven, absolutely. I mean, we, we I think that there's a, a cultural necessity on everyone's and everyone's part to be racially driven to support their culture and to support them their own identities. I think that where we get into where we really show our our ignorance and maybe our adolescence as a country is that we still think that let me back up for a second. I think that promoting the idea that systemic racism is an immovable line is a problem. And I think that if we're going to solve the problem of race, I think that we all have to start becoming hypercritical on the idea that good behavior is good behavior and bad behavior is bad behavior. And we go back to this idea of a transcendent morality. We only solve the problem with race if we apply a unified transcendent morality, right? I think that that to me is the only pathway forward. And I think that that's why in this country, at least well, relatively, uh, I think the fact that there is this, there has been this unified kind of good behavior in America, kind of, we use kind of air quotes around that. Uh, we've seen like decade by decade, things tend to trend upwards when we do that. And when we maybe have self-directed leaders or people who are pushing an, a, a, a weird ideology or their own version of totality, it, it, it stresses the system and it stress and it starts to challenge this unifying thread that binds us all together, which is that transcendent morality. I, I, I don't want to name movements by name, but I think that throughout going, going back, even from the early fifties and sixties, all the way to the present day, depending on what culture is doing, what movement, um, all of these things challenge this transcendent morality. And as a result of that, we kind of echo around and we bounce around. Well, and, and, and now, now we can talk about class because Marx would assert that historical determinism says that there will be a war between classes regardless and, and by, by the way he looked at class as the totalitizing or the to, yeah the totalitizing ideal it was above everything else he thought all the rest of it was just nonsense okay the the subsequent thinkers to marx the feminists <clears throat> the racialists uh the techno technophiles um <laughs> You're even seeing this in the climate change movement. The environmentalists um, take this idea of class and all they do is just switch words around. So it's not class that's the historically totalitizing ideal. It's the environment or it's race or it's gender or it's sexual identity or it's national origin or if it's ethnicity or whatever is on the EEOC list of approved things that we right. have to hire people for. Okay. Fine. But the Black Lives Matter movement, and by the way, you can go look this up. Uh, the people in the Black Lives Matter movement who were in charge of the money, the money's gone. And I'll name the movement because you can go ahead and come for me. That's fine. Leave Dave alone. You can come for me. I'm a big boy. <laughs> you, you come I, right I on. I have to be a professional fence walker at times. So. <laughs> Dave can be a professional fence walker. It's my podcast. <laughs> Just aim at the right spot. Um, but they, the money's gone. They, they, they took the money and ran um, from, from 2020 and 2021. No accounting, no records. Can't, Vice News couldn't even find these people. So for all of this racial consciousness raising, in essence, we have a movement in the last couple of years that turned out to be, and I will be again, I'll be blunt, turned out to be a shakedown. Just let's call it what it is. If it were any other race doing it, we would call it a shakedown. Okay. So class still means something. So let's ask the deeper question that Marx would probably ask here. How do we solve the class problem? 
again, we come back to transcendent morality. I think that Marx is right when he makes the the proclamation essentially that class class struggles lead to warfare. And I think it's because when people transcend from class to class to class and they move up the social hierarchy, we inevitably end up looking down our nose as where we came from and from where we are. And I think this this weird adjustment, this weird change in, uh, in how we view others, right? It's a very narcissistic thing. And I think that, that, well, I mean, at least in my lens, like one of the, one of the fundamental struggles uh, that, that causes narcissism to be a disorder is that it's one of the, one of the strategies that they apply is to jump rungs. If there is a social ladder that moves like such, Mm-hmm. narcissist likes to jump rungs and mm-hmm. what they do is they when they by jumping rungs then they look down their nose and burn the bridges with those people below them and inevitably they end up burning a bridge they shouldn't have burned and it becomes the humpty dumpty story they fall mm-hmm. down and they shatter and they can't put themselves back together again that therein lies the problem with that whole uh, way of being and i think that classism classism is where we're going i think that i think that we have maybe missed our missed the the thing hidden in plain sight all this time i don't think it has anything i I think that when we get caught up on race in america i think what people maybe should be focusing their attention on more would be is the cultures the cultural the cultural approach to society that is different within every culture leads to different financial structures based off of the ideologies that those cultures hold. Meaning that if people are going to worship certain music groups or certain types of music, certain performers, certain athletes, certain things, and those people propagate certain things culturally, like for instance, opposed to having a savings account, we like soup up our 91 Caprice and put rims on it, right? Just for the sake of argument, right? Well, if you're going to dump $7,500 into that versus the, say, the other person of any other race that maybe is putting that into investments or doing that, is this now a racial problem or is this an, uh, is this an educational problem? I don't, I mean, I think that, again, depending on where you're standing and looking at this, I think either side could be argued. Mm-hmm. But I think that fundamentally, like, we solve the race problem in America when we can unify with each other, that there is a path that we should be taking and that there is a certain, there are better choices to be made. And they're not to say that your personal opinion or your personal like affiliations or attractions to things are wrong. It's just that we need to start calling a spade a spade. Certain behaviors have consequences, good or bad. And I think that we come back to this idea of the book of this transcendent morality by saying, well, what is, what is morally just to your soul? What Mm -hmm. behaviors are going to fundamentally allow you to be, to look at yourself in the mirror and feel positive and to welcome yourself and to welcome the gaze of your own judgments upon yourself. I think you have to be moving in a direction that you find to be morally just because in my line of work, what I tend to find all the time is that the torment that people carry within themselves is because they are living a life that they do not respect. Mm -hmm. And they are living a life that they purposely try to hide because they know deep down inside that they are not being morally virtuous and they're not being morally just, but rather they're being, they're being greedy. They're being Mm -hmm. self-entitled. They're being lazy. And yet now they're, they're screaming at the ills of society, yet no one's ever taken responsibility or accountability for their actions. Uh, I think that is maybe the biggest, the biggest tragedy of the 21st century is that people have lost sight of the fact that no one's here to help you but you. And if you lose sight of that, I, I think that, that that echoes out from us. Like meaning if, if there are pillars in society, whether it's in the Black Lives Matter movement, whether it's in uh, whether it's Congress, uh, let's just look at Congress alone. When we have elected officials that it is undeniable that they are not only doing things that are illegal, but they're doing things that are morally reprehensible. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Think about the echo that, that that bell rings and then that frequency permeates society, allowing us other people to, to vibrate at that same frequency. And it becomes a very <sighs> yeah, yeah. compelling 
pull away from this moral, like this, this morality that we're supposed to unify us. Well, and when you lose faith and it's not lose faith, it's not faith. I don't want to use that term because that's loaded. I would say um, when, when institutions, yeah, when, when institutions present their inequities, right? When, 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 not only that, but when the average person working inside of those institutions begins to reveal biases or preferences and does not and believes that the system should reflect those biases and prejudices, regardless of which side politically those biases and prejudices are on. I don't care about that. If you are unable to be neutral and just do the thing that the system is requiring you to do to keep everything functioning, well, that's how you have the end of a civilization. That's how you have the end of a culture. Um, that's how you have the end of a nation state, which fundamentally can be either a pleasant parting of the ways. But I don't, I've never heard, well, no, I won't say I never have. Historically, there are very few examples, and I'll point to the British empire ending as the most recent maybe pleasant example there's very few pleasant examples um of that parting happening and i don't think that anybody on this continent in this particular nation state wants to see any of that happen so we have to figure out a way to yes to, to acknowledge that yes there's class yes there's race yes there's all these things but there must be a higher principle, which again goes back to what we opened up with. There must be a higher ideal that is that that we are serving that is beyond that is beyond that. And I think maybe just to honor the fact that you don't have to be. I don't think that um, a transcendent morality is simply a Christian ideal. I think also too that I think that within a society where we are a melting pot of many different races and many different religions, mm. I think that morality can can transcend religion, and I think mm -hmm. that morality can transcend God in the sense mm. that that if everyone in society has a subjective viewpoint, whether within the same religion or counter to that. I think that being being accountable to something bigger than you is this magical thing. It's the X factor. Because I think that when we, we behave very differently when we're on film than when we do when we're not on film. Mm -hmm. And when we know that someone's watching us, we, we very much modify our behavior. And I think that the role of God in society is that modifier. I think that it allows us to realize that there's that someone's watching that there is this authority that's with us wherever we go and however we handle ourselves. I don't, I wouldn't say that the morality of Buddhists is better or worse than the morality of Christians. But what I would say is that if both parties understand that there is a transcendent existence, a transcendent place or a transcendent idea that we need to be accountable for our behavior and our, and our, our judgment, maybe the, whatever, like maybe what I'm asking for or talking about is this idea of judgment. And I think that mm. in our society, I think regardless of what religion we have in America, I think that what binds us is the Christ, Judeo Christian ideal. And I think that the Judeo Christian ideal allows for every other religion to hold space in this with one condition. And that one condition is that this acceptance, this authority that we need to be accountable and responsible to not only ourselves but our neighbors and our society i think that that gives space i mean that's mm -hmm. maybe just my my lens on this a little bit jesus told the pharisees when they tried to quiz him in john <clears throat> also in matthew but most notably in john um the Pharisees asked him, what are the two rabbi? What are the two greatest commandments? Or what is the greatest commandment? He said, uh, well, because he was a good Jewish boy, by the way, in case you didn't know, Jesus was Jewish because he was a good Jewish boy. He said, he quoted from Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your body. 
and then you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Upon these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. After, of course, saying that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And then, of course, the Pharisees asked him, well, who is my neighbor? <laughs> because if you're the Judeo, in the Judeo-Christian part of that, you like having a good discussion. And Jesus responded with the story of the good Samaritan. Who is your neighbor? Uh, yeah. Who is your neighbor? Back to the book as we sort of round the corner here we kind of want to talk a little bit about leader what leaders should get from Dostoevsky because we've, we've explored a ton of different philosophical theological social cultural uh, psychological and emotional ideas here in just the first four chapters of Dostoevsky's crime and punishment again not a book for the faint of heart so go get it. I would recommend the audiobook version if you're not a big reader. Um, the dramatic reading is actually kind of amazing um, of it. Um, and you can read it in chunks. Um, it kind of helps with the Russian terms and the Russian and the Russian uh, the Russian uh, names that are in here because um, those can be a little bit of a, a little bit of a hard read <clears throat> in, um, in English. But I want to kind of move forward a little bit from where we were at. So he meets the clerk at the tavern. Takes the, clerk, takes the clerk back to his house. Um, you may want to read that because there's a whole domestic piece there that is absolutely amazing. Um, it never happened to Norm on Cheers like that. <laughs> it's one of the first things I thought. That never happened at the end of Cheers. <laughs> uh, so um, might have happened at Fraser's house, actually. That might have happened at Fraser's house, but it didn't, it didn't happen in Norm's house. <laughs> and so uh, go forth and uh, go forth and read that. Um, and then Raskolnikov returns to his flat and he has a letter from his mother. Now, this is where it is revealed that, yes, though Raskolnikov is a student, he also has a family. Um, his mother has been writing him on a regular basis, um, updating him about things that are going on outside of St. Petersburg back in his home. And he, she writes in this letter about the courtship of Raskolnikov's sister um, by a man named um named um, Pietro Pietrovich. And Pietro Petrovich is, talk about class consciousness, a lawyer and is moving up in the world, basically. He's, uh, to, to, to David's term, um, he's not skipping steps. He's taking each step up the mountain, um, much to Raskolnikov's dismay. And the letter from his mother, which the text uh, uh, Dostoevsky writes here, um, in amazingly vivid terms. And we're taking the back half of the letter here. We're going to visit this as we close um, and talk about this a little bit as we close. But, you, you know, Dostoevsky lays this out um, for us in, in real terms. And so back to the, the book from Raskolnikov's mother's letter to him. Oh, by the way, his sister is Doña. So Rodya, dear, he may be of great use, greatest use to you, meaning Pietro Pietrovich, in every way indeed. And Doña and I have agreed that from this very day you could definitely enter upon your career and might consider that your future is marked out and assured for you. Oh, if only this comes to pass. This would be such a benefit that we can only look upon it as a providential blessing. Speaking of transcendent morality, Doña is dreaming of nothing else. We have even ventured already to drop a few words on the subject to Pietro Petrovich. He was cautious in his answer and said that, of course, as he could not get on without a secretary, it would be better to be paying a salary to a relation than to a stranger, if only the former were fitted for the duties, as though there could be any doubt of you being fitted. But then he expressed doubts uh, whether your studies at the university would leave you time for work at his office. The matter dropped for the time, but Doña is thinking of nothing else now. She has been in a sort of fever for the last few days and is already making a regular plans for your becoming in the end an associate and even a partner in Pietro Petrovich's business, which might well be seeing that you are a student of law. By the way, this is the first time we find out what Raskolnikov actually went to school for. Uh, 
I'm in complete agreement with her, Rodia, and share all her plans and hopes and think there is every probability of realizing them. And in spite of Pietro Petrovich's evasiveness, very natural at present, since he does not know you, Dorna is firmly persuaded that she will gain everything by her good influence over her future husband. This she is reckoning upon. Now we're going to skip down. Um, he is a practical man and might take this very coldly. It might seem all to him simply a daydream. Neither has either Dorna or I breathed the word to him of the great hopes we have of this helping us to pay for your university studies. We have not spoken of it in the first place because it will come to pass of itself later on and he will no doubt without wasting words offer to do it himself. Um, as though he could refuse Dorna that. The more readily since you may by your own efforts become his right hand in the office and receive this assistance not as charity but as a salary earned by your own work. Donya wants to arrange it all like this, and I quite agree with her. And we have not spoken of our plans for another reason, that is, because I particularly wanted you to feel on equal footing when you first met him. When Donya spoke with him, his enthusiasm about you, he answered that one could never judge a man without seeing him close for oneself, and that he looked forward to forming his own opinion when he makes your acquaintance. His mother's letter had been torture to him, but as regards to the chief fact in it, he had felt not one moment's hesitation even while he was reading the letter. The essential question was settled and irrevocably settled in his mind. Never such a marriage while I am alive, Miss Delusion be damned. The thing is perfectly clear, he muttered to himself with a malignant smile, anticipating the triumph of his decision. No, mother, no, Donya, you won't deceive me, and then apologize for not asking my advice and for taking the decision without me, I dare say. They imagine it is arranged now and can't be broken off, but we will see whether it can or cannot. A magnificent excuse. Pietro Petrovich is such a busy man that even his wedding has to be post-haste almost by express. No, Donya, I see all and I know what you want me to what you want to say to me, and I know, too, what you were thinking about when you walked up and down all night and what your prayers were like before the Holy Mother of Kazan who stands in Mother's bedroom. Bitter is the ascent to Golgotha. Mm, so it's finally settled. You have determined to marry a sensible businessman, Avdatoya Romanovna, one who has a fortune, has already made his fortune, that is so much more solid and impressive, a man who holds two government posts and who shares the ideas of our most rising generation, as mother writes, and who seems to be kind, as Doña herself observes, that seems that seems beats everything, and that very Doña, for that very seems, is marrying him. Splendid, splendid. His bitterness grew more and more intense, and if he had happened to meet Mr. Lujan at the moment, he might have murdered him. A bit overprotective. <laughs> I, sh I shouldn't laugh. Uh, but I'm laughing because Dostoevsky nails all the bitterness, the resentment, the hatred that he had been hinting at. And this is in chapter four, by the way, when the letter comes. In the first three chapters, he, he's hinting, 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 and finally the bomb goes off. It's Anton Chekhov's gun, right? This idea that you don't show something without it actually being used. You don't introduce a character or an idea in a story without fully referencing it back to it and then fully completing it and closing it. We don't do that these days. We have Netflix streaming shows. We leave Chekhov's gun laying around all the time and never fire it. It drives me crazy. But, <laughs> but Dostoevsky goes right to it. And he just, he blows it up in that letter. Duty, honor, pride, bitterness, jealousy, wrath, all of these things, right? Someone wants to help Raskolnikov. And Raskolnikov wants to get in the way. How do we act? How do we behave when pride gets in the way? Because fundamentally, it's pride. I mean, I think of another movie, Pulp Fiction. Uh, you know, when um, Bruce Willis is asked to throw the fight. <laughs> and the black guy, I can't remember his name now, um, punches him in the face and says, you know, you're, you're going to want to think that you can get over me, right? Because it's the, the guy who's uh, who's dealing him the, uh, the money to solve his gambling problem. And uh, I'm going to curse here a minute here. 
forgive me, mother, but I'm going to do it because <laughs> this is the line. He said, don't you think, don't you think that that's pride fucking with you? Fuck pride, <laughs> you know, basically, you know, to throw the, to throw the, uh, to throw the fight. Pride here is messing with Skolnikov. How do you overcome pride? How do you overcome bitterness? How as a leader do you graciously accept help as we turn the corner here towards thinking about staying on the path? How do you accept help? How do you overcome pride? How do you prevent it from screwing with you? It's a great question. Uh, I think... I think we must never forget that pride is associated with honor mm -hmm. and how does one attain honor? Well, they have to have a little bit of humility to understand that they can't possibly know it all. Mm -hmm. They can't possibly do it all. So when pride gets in our way, I think, I think we have to remind ourselves that who you're only upset, right? Because you're in a position or maybe that you're seeing someone in a position that you want to be. And I think that when we get, when pride gets in our way, I don't think it's really so much pride anymore. It's envy and it's jealousy at this idea that you're where I want to be. So don't, don't patronize me. Don't, don't, don't give me this, the scraps off your table. But really what they're saying is you haven't earned your place at the table yet, but mm -hmm. you have to have some humility. That's just the setup for Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. That's just the first four chapters. <laughs> I wasn't kidding. It's a deep book, and there's a lot you can grab from it. Leaders should read hard books, and leaders should engage with hard topics. Leaders should be thinking theologically, philosophically, um as well as practically and rationally about what it actually means to be a leader and what leadership actually entails. It's interesting that David just mentioned humility. Um, I'm part of a small group of business leaders that gets together every morning and uh, every week, um, once, once a week in the morning at six o'clock. And there's nothing like getting together with a bunch of people in the morning at six o'clock to make you humble. And I'm not going to reveal anything about any of those meetings because A, they're confidential, and B, I'm just not going to do it. However, I will say this. One of the things that we have been talking about recently is this idea of humility. What does it actually mean to be humble? What does it actually mean to be a humble leader? And a great insight that I've come to from this group is that humility is not the same as timidity. We confuse humility with meekness. We confuse humility with lack of action. We confuse humility with uh, avoiding conflict or engaging in or disengaging with conflict in order to create fake peace. Let us not be confused, though, in the 20th century. And let us not be confused in the 21st century. Leaders must speak and act with boldness. Recently, I was at the John F. Kennedy uh, Memorial in Dealey Plaza in Dallas. And John F. Kennedy said in his first inaugural address, let every nation know, whether it wishes us good or ill, that we will support any friend, oppose any foe, uh, on and on and on and on and on, right? to ensure their survival and the success of liberty. A bold statement in an inaugural speech full of bold statements that created the Peace Corps and did a whole bunch of other things. Kennedy had been tempered by war. He'd been tempered by his family. And of course, he had been supported by wealth. He was the first television candidate who really revealed Nixon's feet of clay. And by the way, Nixon never forgave him for that. Well, well, well. So what do we do as leaders when we're not Kennedy and we're trying not to be Nixon? We're trying to lead in our businesses. We're trying to lead in our families. We're trying to lead in our communities in times that look as though they are increasingly being led by, or we are increasingly being led by men who are okay being tyrannical and being bold about it. 
our responsibility as good moral and ethical leaders is to figure out where our good morals and ethics come from. This is what Dostoevsky would tell us. And then our responsibility is to open our mouths and speak boldly and courageously and assert effectively what exactly it is we plan to do. Lay out a vision, lay out a path, and then pick up our cross and lead our teams step by step without skipping steps to the top of the mountain. And will we get there? Well, we may or we may not, but we gotta have the courage to go on the walk in the first place. I think that's what Dostoevsky is showing us fundamentally at the beginning of Crime and Punishment. And of course, when you read the remainder of Crime and Punishment, you see Raskolnikov's path. You see the impact of the steps that descend downward, not upward. So leaders have choices. Choose your direction wisely. Dave, do you have anything to add? Anything you'd like to promote today for the folks on the podcast? And thank you for coming back. Uh, we always have deep conversations as always. I always feel like it's good. I don't know if you feel like it's good, but like I always feel it's good. We have deep conversations, but do you have anything you'd like to, uh, you'd like to add or you'd like to promote today? Maybe just an, an ad, maybe just my own reflection on our conversation. And that is um, freedom is a result of responsibility, taking responsibility. And I, when we're talking about humility, I think that I think it's, uh, I thought it was really poignant when you were pointing out the, that we miss, we misplace our definitions of humility on other things. And I think the humility is the inescapable reality of our own incompleteness, that we have to be willing to understand that, that it's only when we strip our ideas and ourself away from the moment, can we be truly humble and truly present with things and good leaders. Like the themes in this book are combinations of things. It's, it's alienation. It's this idea of injustice and crime. It's this idea of, inevitable suffering and this also this like this morality that we have to all face and i think that good leaders are bound by a dualistic kind of approach that we both have to be great listeners as much as we have to be great advocators and i think that without those two components there is no leader there there's just someone masquerading as a leader because we will inevitably find ourselves in the company of the self-righteous and those people who have their own agendas and it's when we it's when we challenge ourselves to realize that we are only as good as we're only as good as when we accept our faults. We're only as good as when we can own up to the fact that we are going to miss it. We're going to miss the mark. We're going to misjudge. We're going to misspeak, and to not make clever defenses or deflections for that, but rather own up and and let people see our own humanity. To, I think when we bear one of the crosses that nobody can put down is the cross to see yourself positively and through your own eyes. I think that that's a, that's a very, very profound challenge that, that is latent in everyone's life. And I think that leaders have an extra cross that they have to bear. And that is that they are the rolling example. They are the, they are essentially the vision of what is a destination for other people that follow them. And when we talk about business leaders, it's how business leaders not only treat, uh, honor themselves, but it's how they treat the people that support them and how the people that they lead. And so I, I think that this, how this book applies to leaders is like you said before, it's like an MC Escher painting. There's staircases everywhere. And we have to be very, very aware of the fact that it's, we're never on, we're not always going to take the right staircase, but we have to have the humility. We have to be willing to pause and step back for a second and to go, you know what? I misjudged that. I miss, I, I misread that and own those things. Because I think that when we own our mistakes, when we own our maybe misdirections in life, I think that that's how we truly gain power. And we ascend to a different level within ourselves, especially within companies and within the communities we exist ourselves in. Um, because we've seen how that doesn't play out with our society. We see how the endless deflection and the endless excuses of not only people in political power, but people in high, in very powerful businesses 
well, what happens? It, it sets a cascading effect. And once you lose credibility, it's impossible to get it back. And I think that leaders need to fundamentally, I think that good leaders know this. And I think that good leaders understand that in the war for positive change and growth, that it's okay to lose some of those battles and to own up that I, I misjudge those moments. And I think that when we show the people that, we, that follow us that part of who we are, I think that we strengthen the alliance and I think we strengthen our team. And I think that we really foster the growth and development of new leaders that are coming behind us. I don't really have anything to add to that. If you want to stay on the path, we have some products and services that'll help you do that. So at the beginning of this podcast, you'll, you will have heard our ad for our upcoming book, my upcoming book, my third book, 12 Rules for Leaders, the foundation for intentional leadership. I'd like you to pick that book up uh, coming out April of 2022. Um, so yeah, go ahead, pick up that book, go grab that. There's 12 rules that we believe every leader should at least follow, right? Uh, from leadership roles and responsibilities all the way to adapting to change. Because how else are you going to know how to lead unless you know what the rules are, right? Or if you don't know what the rules are, you can't possibly lead. Also encourage you to pick up um, and check out our Leadership Toolbox solution online. Go check us out at leadershiptoolbox.us. There you can check out all of our remote webinar products. Um, you can check out our book. You can get yourself on the pre-order list. And you can also take on a click on the link and listen to this podcast leadingkeys.com is designed as a subscription-based service with asynchronous content to help you become a better leader and of course we have other books out there my boss doesn't care a little red book r-e-a-d that now has become a little red r-e-d podcast check that out twice a month my boss doesn't care Go listen to that podcast because if your boss doesn't care, what exactly are you going to do about it? And that may be your cross to bear. Finally, if you want to book me, if you want to have me come by, if you want to have me talk with your group, you can go connect with me at heysonsorrells.com. There's a booking link right there. You can click on that and you can book me. And of course, I would encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel, the HSCT Publishing YouTube channel, where the video of this interview and this conversation with Dave and I uh, will be live there coming up in just a few weeks, as well as all of our other video podcasts that are there. Check us out on YouTube. Just look up HSCT Publishing, like, tell your friends, and subscribe. Finally, my producers in the background are always yelling at me about this, and I've neglected to say it for the last, like, 15 podcasts. <laughs> but I'm going to beg your indulgence. If you like the podcast, if you like listening to long-form conversation around heady books like Crime and Punishment or The Unbearable Lightness of Being or The Prince by Niccolò Machiavelli, talk about narcissism. Um, if you like listening to us read from Lenin or our upcoming books focused on Ernest Hemingway and John Steinbeck, Willa Cather, if you want to hear more of this, well, then we need your reviews. So go to Spotify, go to iTunes. Spotify now has the capacity for you to give reviews and give a five-star review to this podcast if you really like it. If you want to give me a one-star review, if you want to give us a one-star review, don't go there. Just don't subscribe, right? But if you like it, I ask that you subscribe. I ask that you leave a review on iTunes or on Spotify or on your favorite podcast player. All right, I want to thank David again for coming by. He's he's done a, a another great uh, had another great conversation with us. A lot of deep insights there, and uh, stay on the path, ruthlessly and relentlessly and intentionally, stay on the leadership path. I'm out.